we were um, evicted from my apartment. Me, me and my family, it was a family of, well, at first in our house we had a family of eight, but in a, you know, a family member started to drift off, go their own way. So it ended up being a family of four. Me, my two siblings, and my mother. So we ended up getting evicted, and we all separated in a way. Like, I, my brother went with my aunt, and my sister went with my other aunt. So, and, but I stayed with my mother at the shelter. Like, one thing I hated was sleeping arrangement. I could not stay in the same room with, like, how many families is Four other families in my room. Because, like, the room was literally the size of a classroom. Okay. And it had, like, two beds for each family. So if, it was me and my mother, so it had two beds. And then uh, two cabinet closets type thing. So you can have your lock in your closet, you lock mm -hmm. your stuff up. As me and my mother always say, they said, we always watch people leave before we actually leave out. Um, I um, was raised in a foster home. I did not know my father. My mother was uh, mentally ill and she had a, a crack addiction. So those traumas are the things that helped me um, to recognize trauma in others. But I was always moving around. I never stayed still for a long period of time. There were a lot of people coming in and out of my life. Um, I didn't have much family. And like I said before, my mom was in and out of the streets doing drugs, so it was hard to focus. The minds and memories of thousands of young people in the District of Columbia are severely damaged every day by encounters with violence, not just gun violence. Collectively, they form an unhealed wound that is felt in every ward of the city without regard for race, class, or ethnicity. When I talk about trauma, I think I, I use a broader, maybe a layperson's understanding, and it encompasses, I think, three very important kinds of trauma. So one is adverse childhood experiences, things that happen in a child's home that are difficult, sex abuse, even divorce or the incarceration of a parent that's disruptive to the safety of a home. But in, sadly, in our city, there's also lots of trauma outside the home. So kids who witness gun violence or other kinds of violence on the street. And then the third kind is toxic stress, which is the, the slow, steady beat of anxiety and fear for families that are living really on the edge, whether it's the edge of homelessness or not having enough food, where the parents are so focused on daily survival that that level of stress has an ongoing impact. Um, and as a lay person, each of those kinds of trauma matter. We see young people really through three doors. First, uh, we are the exclusive prosecutor of juvenile crime. And so we see young people who are alleged to be involved with a crime. That's one. Second, we play a role in uh, advising the, um, the Child and Family Services Administration with respect to kids who are either the victims of abuse or neglect. And so we see those kids also. And then lastly, through our, our Child uh, Support Services Division, we get a real good look at the kids who need to have financial support from a non-custodial parent in order to escape poverty or have more means within poverty. Through those three doors, um, for example, um, we see what brings kids to the juvenile justice system. We see what brings kids through the abuse and neglect system. And we also see the real poverty uh, that children in the District of Columbia are living in. And we know from those three systems that there's a common denominator. And that common denominator is trauma. It's more widespread than people um, would typically think. Um, when we just restrict it to thinking about abuse or neglect, um, then it, people may not think of it as being as prevalent. But when you think of it as the more expansive definition, so not having a parent in the home or being removed, removed or having an absence of a parent, um, experiencing community level violence, um, experiencing bullying uh, in a school environment, um, not having sufficient resources in the home, um, to be able to provide for daily needs, not having access to food. Those things are more widespread at the community level than most people would typically um, imagine, uh, especially in some urban communities. And in certain parts of the District of Columbia, um, or a few, many of our children are experiencing trauma related to these factors. It often comes out in, in two ways. Um, number one, the relationship that they have with other people in terms of not being able to have close and trusting relationships. Um, and then the other way that it manifests is their relationship with themselves, what they think of themselves, um, their self-esteem, their confidence, the, um, the, their motivation and the things they feel like they can do. 
So there's been a lot of research that says that continually um, experiencing trauma, it really changes the shape of your brain. It changes the way that you can react because if you're traumatized, especially traumatized early and often, um, then the lens that you look through and the way that you react to things is not gonna be the same. Um, for example, if you may perceive something as trauma, even if it's not because your brain has been used to going into trauma mode and your brain has been used to going to, to protection um, of itself and, and of you, so there's a whole way that the brain now has to react and that, that destroys you know, kind of your decision making skills, your coping because you're, you're in a situation where even when there's not a threat, your brain is heightened and is hypervigilant and thinking that there's something that could happen, that mm -hmm. could impact or affect you. Hello, and welcome to a special edition of the Barris Report, Trauma, a Barrier to Academic Success. I'm your host, Jonetta Rose Barris. The state of childhood in the nation's capital is precarious at best. Some children are being shot or killed. Others are using drugs running away from home, are getting caught up in the juvenile justice system. Far too many are failing school. Nearly 50% of children citywide have suffered two or more adverse childhood experiences. Researchers have concluded that children ages six to 17 who have two or more adverse childhood experiences are more likely to be disengaged from school. Many district leaders and residents have focused their attention on gun violence. That certainly requires attention. More pervasive and longer lasting is the violence of toxic stress. Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, author of The Deepest Well, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity said this, childhood adversity literally gets under our skin, changing people in ways that can endure in their bodies for decades. It can tip a child's developmental trajectory and affect physiology. It can trigger chronic inflammation and hormonal changes that last a lifetime. It can alter the way DNA is read and how cells replicate, and it can dramatically increase risk for heart disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes, even Alzheimer's. The impact of trauma is indisputable. Unresolved trauma is literally destroying our children. Stay with me during this special as we bring you the voices of those who have been traumatized, of government officials, experts, and advocates screaming for the public's attention, screaming for help on behalf of the district's children and youth. Davon Harris was in elementary school. Money was tight in his home and his mother was being beaten regularly by her domestic partner. Soon, the family was evicted. Two of his siblings went to live with relatives. He and his mother went to a homeless shelter. There was a few other homeless students that actually went to my school. I didn't know they was really homeless mm -hmm. until I met them on senior day. Oh, we go to the same school is how mm -hmm. it was. But how we was taught growing up, mother, my mother and my grandmother told us this all the time, is to never look like where you're from. So we do not look like we was homeless. We, as close as I got with my mother, my, me and my mother got so close when we got into the shelter mm -hmm. that you know, it was easy for us to express our feelings to each other about oh. the situation. Oh, so I really didn't have to you know, talk to anyone really about it, because mm -hmm. my mother didn't talk to me about it, because mm -hmm. she, she was the person that was actually going through it with me. Right. So we was the only two people in the shelter. My sister and my, you know, my, sister and my brother had the, uh, had the life. They was with other people where we were actually dealing with the homelessness. He thought they were going to stay there for three or five months. Homelessness for Devon and his mother lasted almost three years. During that time, he attended multiple schools in multiple jurisdictions. He was kept back in seventh grade for poor academic performance. In school, he could only think about what was going to happen to him and his mother. Because I wasn't treated right, and they failed me my seventh grade year. Uh, mm -hmm. I wasn't getting the help and the 
everything I needed to, you know, mm -hmm. pass, you know, because mm -hmm. I was crazy because I had one A. And I was like, how you get this one A in math for all Fs? Wow. I said, because that's the only thing I know how to do. It's the only thing that I, I did, that I could do by myself mm -hmm. without a teacher helping me. That I couldn't do the reading without no help. I, I needed help with reading. I needed help with social studies, science, every other subject, even Spanish. We had Spanish too, and I didn't know nothing about it. I was like, what? What am I reading? Like, wow. So, I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't excluded. I just, well, I didn't, I just didn't get enough attention. Yeah. I didn't really want to talk to anybody, really. I, I wanted to go to school, get this over with, <laughs> and go back home to my mother, because it's the only person I wanted to talk to. Finesse Graves sometimes found herself in drug dens making purchases for her mother. It wasn't the life anyone would wish for an eight or nine year old. Eventually, she went to live with her grandmother and uncle in Maryland. Her grandmother's health began to fail. Finesse looked around for options. One day, she knocked on the door of a local foster care agency, pleading to be taken into the program. I would find a family and someone would take care of me and help me go through all of my issues and get past things that I was going through, but it didn't really work out like that. Not really having a mother's love, not having a father around to teach me things, having to move around from place to place to place, no stability, no structure. It was very traumatic um, because I was always moving around. I never stayed still for a long period of time. There were a lot of people coming in and out of my life. Um, I didn't have much family, and like I said before, my mom was in and out of the streets doing drugs, so it was hard to focus. I lived in a group home with people who really didn't care about us. Um, they took advantage of the situation because they received funds for us staying there, and I really didn't learn anything from them. They didn't give us any classes or make sure we went to school. I was really basically a young adult. So at 15, going into 16 years old, I had my own job. I was in high school, but I wouldn't say it was a stressless environment. There were a lot of stress. I deal with a lot of females who were in and out of outside, having sexual intercourse with all type of people, doing drugs, ecstasy and stuff. And this is at an early age of 16, you know. Um, I wouldn't think that going into a group home that I would be around those type of things. I would think that it would be the opposite. But like I said before, sometimes the television will paint a prettier picture than what reality is. Finesse's situation went from bad to worse. Once again, she tried to take control of her life. She petitioned to be declared an emancipated minor. Then she relocated to the District of Columbia. In the beginning, it was hard. Um, I went to a program called uh, Covenant House of Washington. Um, Covenant House helped the adolescent youth from the age of 16 to 24, I believe, at the time. Um, and Covenant House is really good, um, to be honest, but everything is temporary. So after I left Covenant House, um, I was working, I had a job, but my grandmother was really sick. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually she basically died. And that drama had basically woke up the situation that was going on in my life. Um, I lost my job. Um, I had aged out of the program, so I no longer had housing. Mm -hmm. And it was like starting all over from the beginning again. I became pregnant, and I was basically homeless and pregnant. Homeless and pregnant. Mm -hmm. That must have been very terrible for you. It, it was a very traumatic experience. I probably woke up every morning crying. I guess all the stress from, you know, earlier being pregnant and homeless and still having to deal with everything that was going on in my life, I became sick, so my daughter was premature. Um, I had her almost six weeks early. Um, I went to the hospital and had my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, my aunt that doesn't live in that area. She actually lives in Baltimore. She actually came from Baltimore to help us while, since I was sick, because mm -hmm. I had preeclampsia, and she was like sitting on my spine. Mm. Um, so I delivered her early. She was premature. She was four pounds, five ounces. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, um, I went to the shelter. I mean, I felt like I had made a mistake that, you know, throughout my life that I thought that I was doing things that was gonna better my situation, but I felt like I just kept becoming worse and worse. Um, I didn't wanna bring a baby into the world knowing that I didn't have 
the financial aspects together. Um, so it was, it was stressful, it was sad. I mean, I really didn't know what to do. So now I just stay with my mom. The cycle of trauma continued as Finesse Graves' daughter unknowingly inherited it from her mother. Trauma often is not a one and done, explains Sataria Streeter, a psychologist and director of Ascension Psychological and Community Services, and Judith Sandalow, executive director of the Children's Law Center in D.C. Even if you look at the research of how you're supposed to um, physically care for yourself when you have a child in the womb, whether that's eating right and, and getting the proper movement and rest and all of that, um, then you have other researchers who say we need to sing to our children when they're in the womb, we need to um, read to them. So if they're absorbing all that, then just think if the, the parent can't have the food that they need and if they have to go to the corner store and get all the things that are high in salt and fat, um, if the child, instead of hearing Dr. Seuss books, are hearing, you know, arguments and crying and screaming and all of that, then that's absolutely where the trauma actually starts. Mm -hmm. Way too many DC children are living in a state of heightened anxiety and stress based on the uh, difficulties of living in our community, whether it's gun violence or uh, the threat of homelessness, not being sure where their next meal is going to come from, racism from the police and from the community, all of those things together create somewhat of a toxic soup uh, mm -hmm. for kids and for their parents. I don't think we can ignore parents. So the more a stressed a parent is, the more difficult their lives, the harder it is for them to focus on a child. So as we solve problems for children, mm -hmm. we need to think of a two-generation solution and really bring in um, solutions for their parents mm -hmm. as well. D.C. Attorney General Carl Rossin knows the sound and face of trauma more intimately than most. He has studied its contours. He knows that nationally, 90% of youth in the juvenile justice system report experiencing a traumatic event. On average, 70% have mental health disorders and approximately 30% suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. Of youth age 10 to 18 in juvenile detention centers, 92.5% have experienced at least one traumatic event with a median average of six traumatic occurrences. For me, it's like a car that is idling really, really high. When you've got a car idling high, you know something's not right. Mm -hmm. With a kid who is idling high, that means that there's less likelihood that that young person is going to be able to sit still in a classroom, let alone listen peacefully and mm -hmm. try to learn in class. Mm -hmm. With a kid who's idling high with a high anxiety level, that kid is more apt to frankly follow the wrong role models, mm -hmm. engage in impulsive behavior, and yes, land him or herself into the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to the kids like I know you have, mm -hmm. many of them will tell you that they don't feel safe. Not feeling safe, being in a heightened state of trauma, means that more often than not, you're gonna make bad decisions. Racine's conclusion is echoed in the 2017 Youth Risk Behavior Survey conducted by the DC Office of the State Superintendent for Education. It is based on anonymous and voluntary responses from more than 17,000 public middle and high school students. 16.2% African-American respondents, 18.5% Hispanics, 11.5% Asians, and 6.1% of whites reported missing school one or more days prior to taking the survey. Their number one reason? They felt unsafe. How does that translate in school? Consider this fact. 26.7% of the middle school students said they have carried a weapon to school. That is the sound of dangerous anxiety. Still, the district government has not offered a sustained and coordinated response to what can only be described as a trauma epidemic. I think of children in school bringing into that school everything they experienced during the night and the day before out in the community. And for children who've suffered from trauma, they're carrying that a very heavy backpack. And in that backpack, 
might be domestic violence, it might be homelessness, it might be gun violence, it might be sexual abuse or incarceration of a parent. And every single one of those is like a stone in that backpack. And when they show up at school, I picture them weighted down by this heavy, heavy backpack. And that comes into the classroom with them. So if our schools don't help them take that backpack off, they're not gonna be able to focus and learn in school. Stay with us as we continue our special report, Trauma, a Barrier to Academic Success. We'll be right back. When I was your age, I was just like you, fascinated by stars. <sighs> but now, I get to search for life in the universe. And who knows, maybe life is looking for us, too. So we're like aliens to them? Yeah. Does anyone want to be a scientist now? I do. Awesome. We need more girls in STEM. Maybe we can find aliens. I have to meet this guy and have sex with him. If I don't, then he and his friends are going to rape my little sister. One of my students at Frank Ballou High School told me that one day as I was trying to get her to stay after school so I could help her improve her grades. She made that statement effortlessly, without any real emotion. There wasn't any reason to disbelieve her. I wanted to call the police, but she was worried about repercussions for her, so I didn't do anything. Ballou is no outlier. It is an illustrative tale about the effects of unresolved childhood trauma on children and on DC's public schools. Two data sets connect and bind Baloo and public school students citywide. One thread is the independent investigative report conducted by Alvarez and Marcel after the media revealed that many students who had graduated in 2017 from Baloo had not met established attendance and academic requirements. It wasn't just a problem at Baloo, however. 34% of the entire 2017 graduating class of 2,758 students received diplomas in violation of mandatory attendance and academic rules. Alvarez and Marcel also made this illuminating confession. DC public school students face many challenges in maintaining regular attendance, including high rates of poverty, homelessness, work in child care responsibilities, interaction with the court system, and many others. The other tie that binds DC children citywide are standardized test scores. In 2018, 66% of all students in traditional and charter schools who took the English language portions of the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers exam scored below proficient more than 70% scored below proficient in math. Dr. Laquandra Nesbitt, director of the DC Department of Health, explains what is happening. If a child is not healthy, a child cannot learn. Um, and children begin to internalize some of the things that happen outside of the school environment and it affects their ability to learn. Typically on the physical health side, we think about it as if a child is hungry, a child cannot concentrate. So mm -hmm. we think about providing breakfast in the classroom so the child is full, the child can engage actively in the lessons that are prepared for the day. We also have to think about that from the social and emotional well-being perspective. If a child has experienced trauma, if there was a if there was an act of violence at the community level in that child's neighborhood, it disrupts the child's ability to concentrate. And if those things are happening repeatedly and the child is at a level of agitation where they cannot concentrate, they cannot self-regulate, those issues need to be addressed because that child is at a state where they are never able to fully engage in their educational experience and it disrupts their ability to learn and their overall educational attainment. Unfortunately, as therapist, parent, and mental health advocate Rose Shelton explains, not enough people, including those inside the education system, understand the devastating impact of trauma on learning. I'll use specifically this case is a little, uh, there was a little girl and a little boy in my, my kids' classes, and their dad died. 
in the middle of the school year. Mm -hmm. And the little boy shut all the way down. The mother ended up bringing them back to school um, like a couple weeks after everything happened. And he was, he was done. Like he was, this was his hero. Mm -hmm. And the teacher would put him in a square in the middle of the carpet and make him sit there as punishment for not engaging in the classroom, for not getting his homework done. When you have someone who is in the middle of a trauma, mm -hmm. their mind, their body, everything is shut down. No kid is moving on. And if we're honest, most adults don't either. But we've got to pay bills mm -hmm. and we have to maintain our roles and our impacts and, and influences in our lives. But when you have children that are coming to school and some of them not even saying what's going on at home mm -hmm. because they, they fear that if I tell, then the social worker or the, you know, the principal, someone's going to say something and then take away the rest of my family. Yes. Even if it's dysfunctional, it's their family, it's what they know. We're always fighting for what we know, even if it's not good for us. But we still, it's still normal for us. It still gives us some form of comfort. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't stop us from thinking about it and from worrying about it. And kids, when they're hungry, they're um, dealing with all those other things, their mind is constantly churning and churning and churning. If we know trauma adversely affects academic success, why haven't district officials acted with greater urgency? Why have they pretended things are fine while internal and external environments provide indisputable evidence to the contrary? Why have education leaders and others played a form of Russian roulette with the future of district children? Uh, one thing I want to make sure um, that I can be extremely clear on is that uh, Mayor Bowser and all of those who are working on health uh, on the government side, both on the executive branch and the uh, legislative branch are, branch, are extremely committed to acting very quickly in the best interest of our children. Uh, we've had programs that have been placed in our school systems for over a decade as it relates to, to mental health services and behavioral health services and over 20 years um, for school health services related to nursing. And we recognize that even with those programs being in place, we really weren't seeing the improvement in child health that we needed to see in the District of Columbia. So over the past few years, we've been reimagining what those programs should look like in order to improve child health. So shifting our focus away from the provision of those services, so just making sure that they were available, but really trying to connect it to how we could really be committed to improving the overall health and well-being and seeing a change. And that's what these new programs and the program expansions are focused on, is how do we actually put things in place that are going to improve the outcomes. When it comes to the behavioral health or the school mental health expansion, what we're doing here is we're accelerating the access to the services in the schools. So we, when, when the mental health task force, school mental health task force was put into play, very early on we did a calculus that said, if we moved at the same pace we had been moving over the past 10 years, it would take us a decade or more to get those resources into the schools. So now we have a plan that says, we're gonna start this year with the, with the, tw the top percentile of schools, 25, top so 20, quartile of schools yeah. that has the highest behavioral health needs and we're gonna focus on getting them the resources they need in partnerships with the Department of Behavioral Health agencies, the school systems resources, so partnering with the Office of the State Superintendent for Education, DC Public Schools, DC Public Charter School Board, the advocates, the uh, community-based providers, all of them working collectively to put the resources in those schools that can do the prevention, the screening, the early intervention, and the clinical services as appropriate. And over the next three years, we'll move through all of the schools and get the resources in those schools. And we'll put the financial commitments in place that's required to do that. Elizabeth Davis, president of the Washington Teachers Union, doesn't believe that hype, nor does she believe the city is doing enough to help teachers. And the first step is in acknowledging that we're not, Janetta. Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm not someone who for window dressings. I'm saying one of the things that I've learned after four decades of teaching in DC public schools is that we teach students who come, who have been traumatized in various ways. 
And the second thing is that teachers feel the result of that trauma, but are also traumatized by it themselves. How it plays out in the classroom, teachers that are exhausted, stressed out, feel as if they do not have the time to plan the lessons that they need to plan for their students to collaborate with their colleagues, uh, they, they burn out quicker. Mm -hmm. And many of them exit the system, which accounts for DC public schools having the highest teacher turnover rate in the nation. Mm -hmm. And we need to begin to take a look at that. So rolling out social and emotional learning, trauma-informed teaching requires professional development that is sustained. Not one shot, ongoing professional development for teachers. And that requires collaboration. The health resources um, cannot alone be responsive to the health, social and emotional well-being or the health needs of the student. We have to work collaboratively. We have to make sure that our educators, that the school staff, the school administrative staff, know exactly how to engage with the students and how to engage with the health professionals that are being added. The community of practice component that's part of the school mental health expansion ensures that the school leadership, the school staff, work collaboratively with the community-based organizations who are going to be administering the school mental health program in their school. It helps to facilitate a seamless partnership. It, it assesses actually at the beginning of the partnership the readiness for that school to be engaged mm -hmm. and it adds some additional modules to make sure that the school is ready to be able to implement things. So if the teachers need certain types of support, um, then that can be provided to them. So there's, there's different ways that it is structured. Mm -hmm. um, we leave it to the school leadership okay. um, in terms of how they structure their environment, and that's what the school readiness assessment is. Um, it's not a mandate, um, as, as most people would think of it, but it's the school assessing what is the best way for them to meet the needs of their children. Not every school would benefit immediately from that so-called community of practice. What happens in schools when teachers have not received that required trauma-informed training? The problem is exacerbated. Um, I saw one of my daughters really kind of disconnecting. Um, the other one, she's one of those, you set the goal, she goes for it. But when I saw my other daughter kind of like um, separating herself um, from school, not liking school, begging me to homeschool her. Oh, wow. um, and, and this is, you were talking about kindergarten, first grade, begging me to homeschool mm. her. And um, I started to go to the classroom to kind of see if there was something going on. My mom's a teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm from a long line of educators. So um, listening to them, you start to pick up where the signs are. Like if there's something going on, there should be these signs. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, these are the things that you should do. So I tried to put that in action and I went to the school and I saw the kids sitting on the carpet most of the day. They were in learning mode. And we're talking about um, pre-K four, kindergarten, first grade. The breaks um, and, and having fun, it wasn't really present. And um, I watched my daughter, one of my daughters, sit on the carpet and not be present. Um, I, but I also saw that when other kids would get in trouble, she would get this anxiety um, I would see on her face. And so I talked to her about it and she was always saying, I just don't want them to say something to me. So my, I felt like my child was scared mm. <laughs> in the classroom that she, even though she was not experiencing directly what other kids was experiencing, she was afraid that somehow, some way, that reign of, of terror was going to come to her. It wasn't simply an isolated incident. The entire school leadership seemed oblivious to the fact that on a daily basis, children were being traumatized and it was affecting their academic performance and their level of comfort at school. There were a couple of episodes where um, I, I kind of stepped in and um, one of the issues, there was a, a kid, they were in the hallway going to their art class and another little kid kicked him. <laughs> And, but I had been in the classroom a few times where, you know, some kid maybe had done something to him and he would respond, but he would get in trouble. No one would address the fact that he was either kicked or hit. I'm watching this kid more and more throughout the month, throughout the year, 
getting angrier, but I'm also seeing them label this kid. And I've watched him the last few years and I've not, I don't know him to be that type of a kid. And um, he was going down the hall and the kid did, this little kid that uh, kicked him did this again. He turned around and he had his little fist all balled up and he said, I have told you to stop it. And three teachers that were in the hallway come around him. Now they're all standing up. No one's coming down to his level. They're all standing up and they're yelling at him and they're telling him what he better do. And, and so I step in, I get down on one knee and I say, and I, say I was like, what happened? And he said, he kicked me. He's always kicking me and they never do anything. Now he's whispering this to me <laughs> through his little teeth and, yeah. his, and his fists are still balled up, but he's crying, like the tears. And I'm like, you guys don't hear him? They're still saying, we got him, Michelle, team. I was like, no, I'm good, I got him. So I hugged him and I said, like, I hear you. I said, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna stand up, I'm gonna take your hand and I'm gonna walk you to art class. He said, okay. He held my hand so tight that I almost wanted to cry. Take your time. Because I wondered what does this little boy think and feel every day that he comes here. And I didn't want to take it personal, but I did think this is a little black boy. And he has these Caucasian teachers that continue to say that he's bad and he doesn't listen, but he's all He's saying, just not heard. Hundreds of tragic Shakespearean dramas are occurring in many public schools every day. Every day. Even those considered some of the finest. Is it too late for the district government and others in the city to change those narratives, healing children and putting them on the path to successful academic achievement, to prosperous futures? Stay with us as we examine additional actions city leaders could take, should take, to rescue the city's traumatized youth. We'll be right back with this special edition of the Barris Report, Trauma, a Barrier to Academic Success. Hello, I'm Dr. Cicelina Ledbetter, host of A Healthy Mind, with a tip on healthy thinking about parenting. Did you know that the best way to teach your child positive behaviors and good habits is for you to be who you want to see? Modeling good self-care, discipline, goal setting, and healthy interaction with others is the most effective way to teach your children to do the same. To learn more parenting tips, visit www.thinkbeforeyouspank.com or call 202-889-4344. Hello, my name is Princey. I'm in 10th grade and I'm an advocate for helping mental health. Um, when I was younger, something happened to me that traumatized me. But I didn't realize that I was traumatized until recently. And what it did was, it's like all the things came at once. So it's like when something went wrong, that would pop up. Plus like parents stuff, because both my parents have mental illnesses too in their own way. So it's like growing up in that household, like, with all that going on, it's so much, and it like, it takes a toll on you, like, it really does. I be so, I, I'm so tired all the time. I get really sad sometimes, I don't even know why, like, I, I go through so many mood swings, and it's all because of, like, that, well, I believe that most of it is because of that one thing that happened, and it like changed the way that I think and the way that I see things. Um, I, I am in therapy and it, it helps like it really does because he understands like he, he understands my perspective and it's like 
he gives good advice and the advice when I take it and actually apply it to my life it like it changes a lot so yeah Princiana Hudson is lucky Richard Wright Public Charter School for Journalism and Media Arts has a therapist on duty unfortunately there's only one the school has a population of 300 students that means many students who have histories of being traumatized may not be getting help. Princiana, Davon Harris, and other Richard Wright students have launched a campaign to get more therapists inside all city schools. Rose Shelton has done the same. She and the members of Parents Amplifying Voices in Education want significantly more trained mental health counselors. We need some more therapists because there's no way that you can do everybody in the school. You can't do everybody. You can't do everything. You, just, you can't do everybody in the school. Every student. He couldn't do that. So I was like... He can't even do 50% of the can't, students. Yeah, he can't even do half. Yeah. You know? So that's why I made mostly the campaign. And like, I know the school don't talk about it as much as they should. School is like... Our school, we talk about it. You know? Talk about, we need to talk about this a little bit more than we talk about now. But... Because mm -hmm. I see a lot of students don't walk through the door. They're either angry. Like, what you mad at? Like, what happened this morning? They had to go to something at home to come mm -hmm. back. If they come to school angry like that, something happened at home between the mother or somebody happened in the family that made them this mad to come to school like this. Mm -hmm. So that's why I pretty much made the campaign because I noticed that we need more help. We need more awareness. I think we all walk around with secrecy and problems from the past or problems from now that we can't even talk about with people because we're so afraid to explain it to other people or talk to other people about it. Even your own family. I know people that don't even talk to nobody because mm -hmm. they feel as though they can't trust anybody. They can't trust their own family. So like, why don't you meet this whole person that you don't know, but they have like, experience in mental health and your issue. Mm -hmm. Talk to them about it. But we actually need to bring mental health therapists to the kids. Mm -hmm. They're in school all day. A lot of their parents, especially if they're experiencing traumas, there's probably a lot of things going on at home with time, mm -hmm. with energy, with money, mm -hmm. with access and they can't get to therapists. I know in DC, I've talked to some social workers that have referred for kids out and families out to see um, therapists, and they're on wait lists. But bringing mental health counselors into the school system and allowing these kids to have access, not restricted, not saying only if you, you know, have this IP, mm -hmm. but when you have a problem, when there's something going on, this is where you go. You have a counselor, you have someone that you can be assigned to. We need them to be able to deal with their minds and their emotions. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons it's really important is because the studies have shown that if these things are not taken care of when kids are younger, then the dis-ease of their life turns into disease. disease right. And so the risk of cancer is higher. High blood pressure, um, diabetes, obesity, mm -hmm. um, sexual um, uh, dysfunction, whether it be promiscuity or just the fear of intimacy. All of those things impact that child. It's not just about having mental health specialists in schools. Rescuing children and youth suffering or presenting obvious signs of trauma requires the entire city government officials, civic leaders, members of the faith-based community, business leaders become actively involved. That's what happened in Wisconsin, in Washington State and Massachusetts, which has become a recognized leader in creating trauma-sensitive schools. It also has the lowest percentage of children with adverse childhood experience scores of two or more. We can't just think about reforming the, the mental health system. So there's mental health services being provided in schools, and there's community-based mental health services. Both are incredibly important, but we also need to move upstream and begin to stop some of these traumas. We could eliminate the trauma of having an incarcerated parent mm -hmm. if we were more thoughtful about who we arrest and why and not sending folks to prison when we don't have to. Right. Just that by itself would have a transformative impact. We know that home visiting, which is a low cost um, intervention for young parents, um, will prevent abuse and neglect, another major form of trauma. 
we could expand domestic violence services, another kind of trauma. There are so many ways that we could be starting upstream mm -hmm. and preventing those traumas in the first place so we don't have to help kids heal from them. We're only now becoming facile in the language of trauma. Mm -hmm. We're only now understanding the real impacts of trauma on young people. I think, we're, um, I think we're in the early stages mm -hmm. of uh, understanding what exactly uh, is needed, mm -hmm. understanding what that looks like financially uh, in terms of uh, government resources mm -hmm. uh, to the program. I'm heartened uh, by uh, you know, Chairman uh, Grosso's efforts in this regard uh, to put more counselors in the schools, ensure that they have the adequate training um, in order you know, to help the situation at the schools, um, I think we need to press on the gas a little harder. Yeah. But I think the point is this is a massive opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's an opportunity, as I've previously said, you know, to really throw a Marshall Plan out there. Mm -hmm. Go and find out where those kids are, because we know, mm -hmm. who are experiencing trauma and try as best you can to persuade them and their families or responsible adults mm -hmm. to get the kind of treatment that they need in order to be successful at school and in life. What would an anti-trauma Marshall Plan look like in D.C.? Advocates have called for an expansion of existing restorative justice programs, a new operational and teaching model for schools and universal home visits, for example. Vanessa Graves' daughter has watched her mother suffer through unemployment and homelessness. The school administrators and teachers at the traditional public schools the daughter attended never really knew the family's story. You know, when we first started going to Rocket Ship Rides Academy, they would do home visits. Mm. And most people would take that as it, I guess you could say disrespectful. Right. Like someone's prying into their life. Right. And in the beginning, that's how I thought too. Yeah. But what I noticed is that once they got to know what we were going through as a family, they knew how to help Nyla better herself education-wise. So I feel like it's been a struggle. It's been a real struggle trying to get her quality education and for people to understand that she has been homeless and is dealing with things that she shouldn't have to deal with as a child because of gentrification. Mm -hmm. because of living in low accessible areas where we don't have much community help or mm -hmm. access to get better technology or better education. So when those things are established or put into a child's life, then they do get better. Mm -hmm. And I had to go out as a parent and find those things instead of it being accessible to my child. Proponents like Liz Davis and Judith Sandalow believe implementation of trauma-sensitive schools critical to any massive rescue plan that would alter the current academic trajectory of many of DC's children. Well, trauma-informed schools, uh, of course, and of course it means that the staff, the teachers, the principal, everyone, custodians, cafeteria workers, social secu security uh, guards, they're all a part of the staff. They're a part of the school's community. The training, the professional learning that happens should be for all. Mm -hmm. And of course, it means that the individuals in those schools will understand that the, any student discipline, any misbehavior that plays out in the classroom or the hallway or in the playground comes as a result of students who have experienced trauma. A lot of it has to do. And in most cases, students who come from very poor, poor communities. Understanding that, because what they, they, they stop seeing is the child, the discipline as the problem. The discipline is a symptom of the problem. Mm -hmm. What they did begin to do is to dig deeper to see where the problem lies. And the problem is, lies in those experiences that children have in many cases before they even come to a school. Those experiences they have after school, during the weekends, during the summer, uh, in the community. How many students come into our schools each day who have experienced a shooting, mm -hmm. who have witnessed a body on the street. Most of us have never done, that has not happened for most of us. I, I can say that it hasn't for me, but students who have witnessed that and come to school and expected to sit in a seat and learn and listen and pay attention, it's not gonna happen. But I think for all kids who've been traumatized, the building of relationships is harder. 
And we now know that learning only happens in the form of a relationship for everybody. So when a child comes into a classroom, they need to build a relationship of trust and safety with their teacher or they're not gonna learn. And so for me, building a trauma-sensitive school is all about finding ways for children to know that they are seen and heard and cared for in a school setting. I think we have to build in the time for human relationships within the education setting and not separate it out as social emotional learning is over here and academic learning is over there. They actually are, they're knitted together mm -hmm. and you can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't take much time to look somebody in the eye and say their name. Uh, it, it just takes some practice to do it instinctively, but, mm -hmm. but we all can do it. And, and t some teachers are just wonderful at it, but we need the whole school to do that. You know, one of the mantras of trauma-sensitive schools is to ask not what's wrong with that child, but what happened to that child. So if a child begins to misbehave in school, not immediately punishing them, but stepping back to ask the question, what happened? Mm -hmm. um, because then we can solve the problem mm -hmm. and that child can be in class. Wherever states have been successful in reducing trauma while improving the overall academic performance of children, a key element has been a public awareness campaign designed to persuade private sector businesses, nonprofit organizations, and others to engage in the fight. If there is to be an anti-trauma Marshall Plan, public education must occur, says Satara Streeter. So um, we started a campaign called Think Before You Spank, and it basically was saying just that, that we have to recognize um, how we're disciplining our children. The, the word discipline comes from a Greek word meaning to teach. Um, and if we're screaming and we're hitting and all of that, are we really teaching or are we just punishing? And what, you know, if we're, if we're trying to raise children that's going to be able to deal with life in, in 2018 beyond and beyond, why are we still using these measures um, in ter that are, have been used to break people and to break children and to break horses? Like, you know, you, when you want to break a horse, you beat them to mm -hmm. get them to be submissive. But do mm -hmm. we really want to raise submissive children or do we want to raise thinking children who are able to... Um, to make decisions that make sense, who are able to, to think through things and not just act impulsively when we're hitting them impulsively and we're screaming impulsively. And again, it's a, a, a sign of, of trauma. Again, if this parent, if that's what was done to them, mm -hmm. and if they feel so overwhelmed with life because of whatever they have going on that they really don't have time um, to think through their parenting tactics, well, it, it really is an assessment of, let me, let me, think about the things that I say to my child. Mm -hmm. How do I talk to them? How do I uplift them? How do I affirm them? Um, when I do get angry and they do something wrong, how do I go about disciplining them? Do I hit them? Do I scream? Do I curse? Um, if I'm doing those things, why am I doing those things? Has that been passed down? Because that's what was done to me. Was I screamed at or whipped as a child? And is, am I just doing those things to um, and not really being intentional about the way that I want to raise my child and, and the way that I want their future and their lives to be when they grow up. And we have to, to really focus on that and do all we need to to make sure that our children come out of this whole childhood thing as unharmed as possible. Mm -hmm. I did my research and I realized I wasn't really interested in spending a whole bunch of money for education. I have a lot of friends who are going to many different schools and all of them are paying a whole bunch of money. And when I talk to them, their experience is, is kind of similar to mine. There's nothing, they're not getting anything that I'm not getting and I feel like I'm getting a little bit more than what they're getting. I began my long journey through childhood trauma in the nation's capital in 2018 after asking two simple questions. Why would a child miss 30 or 60 days from school? What was happening in his or her life? As I traveled throughout the city, speaking with anyone who would talk with me, I came to know the villain had a name, trauma. It was behind children feeling unsafe in their communities and in their schools. It was behind the hypervigilance some displayed and the violence in which some were engaged. 
It was behind their deep depression and growing desire to end their lives, to commit suicide. It was behind their poor relations with their families and their families' poor relations with them. It was behind their poor physical health, behind substance abuse, sexual promiscuity and sexual misconduct, and it was behind their poor academic performance. I realized there was a silent epidemic in the District of Columbia that only a few people seemed to understand its depth. Children in the District of Columbia are crying for help. Can't you hear them? As a city, we have to reorient our approach to dealing with our children in school, at home, and in the community. A first start must be a mental health assessment for every child in our public schools. We must require that schools present to the public their plans for immediately initiating a trauma-informed operating and teaching approach, including incorporation of universal home visits by officials from DCPS and charter schools. And we must insist on a robust public information campaign that presents in clear language what are the signs of trauma and how parents and others might move to reduce the devastation. We have a moral obligation to our most vulnerable residents. We cannot flinch. We cannot turn a blind eye declaring it's someone else's problem, believing that because we may live in an upscale neighborhood, it's not our issue. Traumatized children can be found in every ward of the city. Don't fool yourself. Our failure to take immediate deliberate action to eliminate childhood trauma means our future will be weighed by an even larger and more costly challenge. Far worse, we would have darkened and diminished the bright promise of our children and youth because we were either too lazy or we lacked the courage to act when they desperately needed us to. Thank you for tuning in to this special edition of the Barris Report. And thank you for doing all you can to end childhood trauma.